Day 393 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine, and we'll start off with heading over to those Russian military losses once again, as Russia is currently sitting on 168,000 150 military personnel losses there. Then when we take a look at the Russian hardware losses, 13 tanks, 11 APVs, a whopping, truly whopping 19 artillery, and even one air defense system. And so we'll head back to the map now, where we'll briefly start out in Russia, where there's been multiple waves of anti-war partisan activity or attacks on the railway lines uh, in Russia in the last really few days in total here. That's right, hit them where it hurts, right in the logistics. As these groups of partisans disrupted Russia's ability to transport fuel and supplies to the front of the, the battle, including in multiple Russian oblasts such as Tatarstan, Perm, Kemerovo and others, so really too many to mention there. And all of this activity here would likely be a clear response to the well, the public dissent regarding Russia's recent new intake of mobilization that the, the Russian political establishment sent out many, many summons to, to many, many regions throughout the entire country of Russia. They did everything but officially announce it. Oh, but also quickly in Russia, a fire broke out at a factory in Yaroslavl. Now, this factory in particular produces the engines for Russian armored fighting vehicles and nuclear missiles as well. So it could certainly be perceived as an honest setback for an already behind Russia as it relates to their industrial capacity. Then we'll move back into the Ukrainian map and we'll start out as we usually do these days in Bakhmut as Russian forces tried to seize the 0506 highway near Krumova. So we need to zoom in for that one here. It's hard to see this, this highway of sorts running all along there and out. Now, initially, the Russian forces gained some ground, but at a later stage, Ukrainian forces managed to oust the, uh, the Russian troops. So the Wagner forces in particular appears couldn't maintain the steam. In fact, Ukrainian General Sersky just hinted about a counteroffensive near Bakhmut, as he said that the Wagner forces in the region have lost considerable strength and are running out of steam. And he also went on to say that he'll take advantage of this opportunity, just as Ukraine did with the uh, taking of taking back of Kiev, Kharkiv, Kupiansk, Kherson, anything with a K really. So in fact, he, he actually left very little to the imagination for when or what he has in store for Bakhmut soon. Then also in Bakhmut, well, this one, next one is a bit of a news story, really, but Ukrainian President Zelensky made an unannounced uh, surprise visit to the front lines and awarded defenders of Bakhmut. And I've got to say, all of this is in pretty stark contrast to Putin's visit to Crimea and Mariupol just five days ago, where Putin did not go to the front lines of Bakhmut. He instead spent time looking at some stones and buildings in Crimea, followed by a 3 a.m. flyover to Mariupol, chatting with some staged locals. And you know what? Out of all of those or well, those two visits, I couldn't even find anything where Putin actually visited or even spoke with soldiers. And that's all probably due to the fact that it's a pretty risky proposition for Putin to actually be around low-level military men with firearms. Meanwhile, Zelensky was everywhere, including even a Bakhmut gas station. So when Russia refers to the larger Ukraine as being somehow illegally controlled by the quote-unquote Kyiv regime, I just don't see it. All I see is a Ukrainian president that is fighting for his country's freedoms. Then we'll move down on the map, and uh, not a great deal happening today on this particular front. But uh, for instance, if we were to take a look at Vuladar, so although due to multiple barrages of failed uh, Russian assault attempts, 
in the, the recent days in this location, Ukraine has become at the moment something more of a mop-up crew once again, sending drone-dropped munitions to some recently abandoned Russian light and heavy armor. Then, as for some of the biggest news in the past day, so Zaporizhia, the oblast, and in fact the city of the wider oblast, took a real hit from Russia today in really the worst kind of way, just hitting a residential building instead of anything of military strategic value or, or substance there. Now, this travesty was done by the Russian KH-59 missiles, which are air-to-surface surface missiles with an accuracy or what's known as a circular error probability of about 3 to 5 meters. Just for reference, about 3 to 5 yards there as well. And I always wonder how to look at these unfortunate events, such as are the Russian missiles specifications much better on paper than they are in real life, thus causing inaccurate targeting? Or did Russia choose to hit this building? Either way, they're getting blamed for all of it. And yet, many in Russia still question why most of the globe is isolating them as a country. Gee, I, I wonder why. Then further down in the oblast, uh, there is some breaking news sources in the last few hours indicating that the Ukrainian forces have penetrated Russian defences near the town of Pologovsky here. Now, we already knew Ukraine was doing some military-style penetration testing in the region, aka reconnaissance by fire, but during that reconnaissance, they may have found some notable weak spots. But we'll have to wait until tomorrow for a bit of a follow-up on that one. Then, moving across to the adjacent Kherson Oblast, Ukrainian military hit an ammunition depot of Russian forces right on the bank of the Dnipro River, south of Antonivka. So right here. Now, the south bank on the Russian-occupied side, just in terms of its distance to the north Ukrainian liberated side, we're only talking about a half a mile, less than a kilometer, in fact, close to half a kilometer, so maybe even a third of a mile. So it's just not... A clever place for Russia to leave their ammo dump so openly exposed at the front contact points. Not to mention Ukraine's drone capabilities have certainly been making some new strides in terms of advancements recently. Uh, 2023 alone, they've come a long way. Oh, then also in Russian-occupied Kherson, a Russian Strela-10 short-range air defense system was destroyed by the Ukrainian SSO. So this is the Special Operations Forces Unit using a drone-dropped munition, or several in fact. As a result, now Russia has to scrape the bottom of the barrel somewhere to deploy yet another air defense system in this region. But they won't be taking it from Moscow. If anything, Moscow is hogging a lot of the, the Russia air defense systems just so that Putin single-handedly feels a bit more secure in his little bunker hidey hole late, late at night. But as for the Strela 10, though, it's old garbage, especially as compared to some of the more theoretically advanced air defense systems currently in use by Russia. Then we'll move down a bit further south, so into Russian-occupied Crimea. So the mayor, the puppet mayor of Crimea reported, quote, the construction of critical infrastructure has begun, as he refers to the military trenches and pillboxes along the western coast of Crimea's beaches. And you know, most people are still asking the question, why? But if it makes them feel a bit safer, then kudos to them. And even with all of these defensive fortifications or useless defensive fortifications there, it still couldn't stop uh, both an unmanned aerial drone, drones and unmanned aer uh, naval drones from potentially taking out a Russian target at the nearby Sevastopol naval base. Now, we've got some grainy footage from this one that shows quite the explosion. Something for which Russia takes very seriously when their naval assets are under threat. So we're probably going to hear a lot more about it in the coming days. I've got a couple of theories on this one, but I'll save it for tomorrow or the next day. 
Oh, and I also almost missed it. Uh, Odessa. So Russia fired four missiles at Odessa overnight. Now, Russia's Ministry of Defense, uh, their version of events, said that uh, two hangars with uh, weapons and military equipment of the AFU were hit on uh, the territory of an airfield near the city of Odessa, but the real-life circumstance or outcome seemed to be quite different. So first of all, Ukraine shot down two of the four missiles, and those other two stray missiles hit the dormitory of a monastery of the Russian Orthodox Church in Odessa. So not exactly a hit, and not exactly the truth either. Then we'll move across to some news for today. We'll start out with a bit of hardware news. So some ammunition for the Challenger 2 battle tanks that Britain is sending to Ukraine includes armor-piercing depleted uranium rounds. Now there's certainly some eyebrows that tend to raise, get raised when we hear the word uranium, with depleted uranium being the key word here. So there's not found to be any clinical pathologies for radiation on these rounds. It just makes them really good at piercing armor. And although the use of these types of munitions are nothing new, does that stop Russia from kicking up a stink about it? Nope, not at all. Which is why I think you need to see these two Russian state-sponsored articles from the Russian TASS uh, media news outlet. Uh, The left article is from 2018, saying Russia is making them for deployment and that it is not violating any international laws. Then the right article, still from the same Russian uh, news agency, written just days ago in 2023, scream into a high heavens, of course, saying Ukraine can't use them as it violates international law. And this is a great example of how Russia operates throughout this entire war, always trying to spin anything they can to their advantage. Not to mention one of their own was literally found lying around in battle. So it looks like we're going to see a little bit of Ukrainian uranium. Yeah, I like it. It's got a ring to it. Then in the lighter side of news, I don't do enough of this. I really should do more. But uh, So just today, 17 Ukrainian children, ages 17 or less, have been returned to Ukraine after previously being deported to Russia. And you know, it was exactly because Russia was getting kids involved in this war in the first place, which led to an arrest warrant on Putin himself. So it looks like he is landlocked in Russia until they overthrow him. Except for maybe the occasional visit to Belarus or maybe Kazakhstan or China. Oh, and take for example this upcoming trade summit in South Africa that Putin was meant to attend in a few months' time from now. Yeah, nah, as they say, like to say down under. So he's no longer going to that one for risk of him going to the Hague, the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Then a quick funny to round it all off for today, guys. So Russia is running out of obsolete T-62s, the T-62 tanks. So what do they do? They send even more obsolete T-54 slash T-55 tanks to Ukraine instead. So the Russian forces transported a a train with the loaded T-54 or T-55 tanks from Primorsky Kray towards Western Russia in some heavy speculation that Russia will use these old fellas in Ukraine. And first designed and built in 1946, just after World War II. So in a way you could say there were tanks designed and built for the lessons learned in World War II. Unfortunately, it's about 80 years later. So really what they're doing is uh, Russia is dusting off older tanks to compensate for their losses. Second best army in the world, my behind. And yes, it's true. A couple of trolls would like to point out Ukraine has a few T-55s uh, themselves. Uh, Specifically, it's the M55S variant they're referring to. So the uh, Slovenian donations of about 28 from memory last year, just under 30, which had the the updated new armor, new optics, new digitalized internals, thus new brains, a new British cannon with armor-piercing rounds, and even with some more comfortable seating as well. 
So what we could say is, as we know, really, Ukraine's tanks are getting newer and newer, more capable and capable. <laughs> Whereas, meanwhile, in Russia, tanks are getting older and older. Again, we have some massive technological disparity upcoming in the battlefield here soon. And whenever there is a hint of anything like this happening, I always say the, say the following. We're even closer now to the, the World War II T-34 tanks. Really looking forward to that. It looks like there's a decent chance that could actually happen now. So thanks for watching, guys. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.